to welcome everybody to the Nature Connections webinar series from the Camel Valley Nature House. I uh, really want to thank you all for joining us today. So I'm Jeff Roten. I am with Metro Vancouver Regional Parks. And uh, this webinar series is graciously hosted by Pacific Parklands Foundations. So I'd like to introduce their executive director, uh, Janet Antonio, to say a few words about the, uh, about the foundation. So over to you, Janet. Thank you, Jeff, and hello to everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, before we begin the session, it's my pleasure to start by acknowledging that the Campbell Valley Nature House is on the ancestral homelands of the Coast Salish First Nations. And I wish to extend my appreciation for the opportunity to hold this webinar on their shared traditional territories. Um, the foundation itself, Pacific Parklands Foundation, was founded 20 years ago to support Metro Vancouver Regional Parks. And uh, our role is to raise funds and give grants to help protect our parks and connect people to nature. So a special thank you to Jeff and to the Campbell Valley Nature House for partnering with us uh, to present these webinars and to Jessica and Zoe for joining us today. I think it's going to be a lot of fun and it's certainly a pleasure to, to be here and to be part of this community. So thank you very much. Over to you, Jeff. Okay, there we go. And Janet, you can turn off your video. There we go. Great, thanks. Okay, so for those of you who haven't been there, the Nature House uh, is in Campbell Valley Regional Park, and that's in South Langley in Metro Vancouver. Um, that's the picture. It's, it, it's currently housed in the, uh, a beautiful heritage uh, barn, and that's the red barn it's in in the photo. Uh, and it has interactive exhibits and displays for the whole family. Okay, so now it is my pleasure um, to introduce um, my two co-workers at Metro Vancouver, Zoe Slater and Jessica Wheatley, uh, and they're going to talk about urban wildlife. Well, thanks everybody for joining us today. I'm super excited to be presenting this webinar with Jessica today. Uh, we've named it Nosy Neighbors, a look at urban wildlife. So it should be hopefully fun and interesting for everybody. Okay, so first I'll just introduce myself. So, so as Jeff said, my name is Zoe Slater. Um, I have a degree in biology, so my background is in biology. I have done field work in the past, and I've done a lot of work out in the Fraser Valley on actually species at risk. Um, I also did work for Bearware as a coordinator in mission. Currently, I work for Metro Vancouver Regional Parks, as Jeff mentioned, and I've been there for about seven years. Um, I worked as a park interpreter, and currently I am the special events assistant um, for the East Area. And uh, my favorite urban animal is a bear. And I'll let Jessica introduce herself. Good morning, everybody. Um, like Zoe said, my name is Jessica Wheatley. I am a biologist as well, but I, by trade, am a wildlife technician. I studied at BCIT at the FWR program. I've worked both locally and internationally on biodiversity studies, taking a look at different ecosystems and cataloging all the things that live there. But more recently, I have started working the last five years for Metro Vancouver as a park interpreter. So my job is helping people to connect uh, to nature through learning a little bit more about some of our local environments. And my favorite urban animal, without a doubt, is the strange and unusual possum. Great. Thanks, Jessica. All right. So we wanted to start with a question asking everyone that's joining us in the webinar. So we're curious to know which of the four animals that we're talking about today, so we're going to be talking about raccoons, coyotes, bears, and skunks, have you encountered either at home or in a park? I think Jeff's going to put up a poll for us. There we go, the poll should be up there. So which of the four animal, animals that we're talking about today? Bear, raccoon, coyote, skunk? And I believe, you, Jeff, you can make choose more than one. Oh yeah, correct? you can answer all of them if you want. Yeah, if you've encountered all of them, you can click on all of them. So again, have you encountered either at home or in a park or in your community? I'll give you a few seconds to vote there. Okay, so you just have to click on the buttons and then to click Submit. Give you another couple of seconds. I'm 
curious for the answer. Okay, so I'm going to end the polling now. I'm going to share the results. And look at that. Wow. So pretty much almost everyone's had encounters with uh, all four animals and bear and raccoon being the highest, which is not surprising. I bet you if we thought about this 10, 15 years ago, though, to think that everyone had had encounters with the bear in their community, you would probably be shocked to hear that. That's awesome. Great. All right. So speaking of bears, let's start with our first one, my favorite, black bears. So um, I think most people, obviously, if 91% of you have had um, encounters with uh, black bears, probably most people are familiar with black bears, what they look like. Uh, one of the myths, though, is that black bears are all black, which is not true. So their fur color can be very varied in coloration. So you have ones that are black, ones that are brown. Sometimes it's described as cinnamon color, but there's also white that which is known as the spirit bear or the Komodi uh, bear. So this actually is a black bear that is a subspecies. Um, so it's not an albino, it just has a different color variation. Some other interesting characteristics of black bears is that they actually have shorter claws than uh, grizzlies, but this actually makes them really great climbers. So they're really good at climbing and much better than grizzlies. Um, Another really interesting thing is about their nasal cavity. So um, if you looked inside the, the nose of a bear, you would see this sort of intricate webbing that they have. And what it does is it increases the surface area in their nose and it enables them to have a really great sense of smell. So bears have been known to be able to smell attractants up to one kilometer away. So that's a pretty far distance. All right, so now I'm going to do a fun question with you all. So I want to ask you, which cartoon bear do you think is the best example of a wild bear based on their diet? So we have Winnie the Pooh, we have Baloo from Jungle Book, and we have Paddington Bear or Yogi Bear. And then Jeff's going to put up the poll. Yes, so Baloo is the correct answer. So uh, Baloo is, if you see in this picture, Baloo is actually teaching Mowgli to eat ants. So ants is actually a typical um, food that uh, bears would eat. So now Yogi Bear, we don't want bears eating like Yogi because Yogi was always getting into uh, picnic baskets in the parks. We definitely don't want uh, our bears eating like Yogi. Uh, Paddington Bear, of course, we don't want our uh, bears eating marmalade sandwiches. And I noticed a few people picked Winnie the Pooh. So you are slightly correct because honey for sure is definitely something that uh, wild bears will go after. So they will um, get into uh, beehives and for sure eat out the honeycomb. But generally what they're actually trying to go for is the young larva inside the, the beehive and that has a really high in protein. So that's actually what they're looking for. And of course, we don't want any uh, bears like Winnie the Pooh actually eating uh, honey out of a jar because that means they've gotten it from human beings. All right, so let's get a little bit deeper into what they actually are eating in the wild. So I'm not sure if it would surprise anybody, but black bears actually their diet is composed from about 80 to 95% of plant material. So uh, I'm sure a lot of people understand that they think they're carnivores and they're heavily eating meat, but they're actually eating more plant materials. So things bears will eat are leaves and buds. Um, they love dandelions, they will eat grass, they will eat fruits and berries. Sometimes they eat roots. Uh, of course, they will eat salmon, they will eat insects like we talked about the ants, um, sometimes small rodents and even carrion, which is like uh, dead animals. So unfortunately, as we continue to grow and uh, expand our urban environment, we come closer and closer into wild areas. And what this means is that bears are now more than ever being introduced to um, human attractants and human food sources or, or foods and things that are linked to um, humans. So for example, our urban bears are often getting into garbage, pet food, uh, compost, bird feed, 
uh, fruit trees on people's uh, properties and also small livestock, but more often it's actually the grain or the feed uh, for the livestock that bears are attracted to. And the reason why we don't want this happening is what it does is it creates food conditioned bears. So these bears feel comfortable being closer to humans uh, because of the food source that's associated with them. So things that we can all do, uh, because many of us now are living in bear country, um, you might have to not put up bird feeders if you live in an area where there's birds. Um, you should put a, be putting your uh, uh, compost and garbage out on the morning of rather than the night before. Uh, don't feed your pets outdoors. You know, clean off your barbecues really well. Because uh, remember, I told you that bears have that, that scent of smell for like a kilometer. Um, other things you can do is um, if you have really stinky, smelly stuff like bones and meat and all that, you can actually freeze it and then put it out in your compost on the morning of so that it doesn't attract um, wild animals. So another thing interesting about bears is that as they're preparing for the end of the year in the fall and they're going to go into their deep sleep, uh, they need to get eat a lot of calories. Another reason why they might chug down a bottle of Pepsi, it's high in calories and sugar. Um, so they need to actually eat 20,000 calories uh, per day in order to gain enough fat stores. So let's look at what that means for us. So 20,000 calories a day could potentially be 80 McDonald's hamburgers. It could be 133 wagon wheels maybe 385 apples. Now remember this is in one day. One day they have to eat this, this many calories. That could be 1,000 ketchup packets or 1,250 little chocolate Easter eggs. So um, they're really trying to get a lot of calories at the end. But just one last thing to remember about the garbage as well is that uh, it, between 2014 and 2017, the Conservation Office Service, they noted that 60% uh, of calls they got from bears, the attractant was garbage. So it's really important that when we're living in areas where there's bears, that we make sure that we're managing um, these attractants so that our bears don't get into trouble. So now let's talk about where they're living. So black bears often will den in like a rock crevice or in a hollow tree, either up above higher or down below. Um, sometimes they'll dig out um, a den on like at the side of a hillside or something like that. So bears might not be denning like uh, necessarily right in an urban area, but if there's green spaces near your homes, they could be denning in there. Um, when I did bear wear, actually, I had a couple people in uh, the community that I live in. Uh, one lady had a bear that was actually sleeping under her deck and she, she had a hard time convincing the conservation officer that this was true. And then I had another uh, family that I had to come out and visit and they had all these recycling bags that were getting pulled and ripped apart. They had a little bit of a uh, row of trees on the backyard and, and sure enough, the bear was coming in there. and then. Um, like this bear sitting in the grass, they had some tall grass and then this big flattened spot. And what was happening was the bear was actually sleeping there at night. So you'd be surprised how close these bears will come uh, into our community, especially if there's um, bear attractants. So let's talk a little bit about their behavior because bears are often misunderstood. And, um, you know, one thing to remember is that bears are really actually a shy animal and they don't necessarily want to be around humans. Uh, they would prefer not to, um, but because as we develop further, now they're just happen to be closer to us. And if there's attractants, they may be nearby. So one thing people often see or um, interpret as aggression is bears standing up uh, on their hind legs which it is not that at all. Uh, basically, it's just bears being more curious. They're trying to get a better sense, maybe a better smell of what they're looking at. Uh, another common behavior, as I mentioned before, is that bears are good climbers. So they will climb trees. Often mothers will send their cubs up a tree and um, this is for safety. And once they feel safe, they'll come back down. So if you ever encountered anything, just best to leave them, uh, leave the area and they will come down at their own. So bears are not particularly territorial. They will live with other bears in a range, 
However, there's definitely a dominance hierarchy. So uh, older males tend to be more dominant in an area where there's uh, younger uh, males and things like that. So this fellow up here in the top picture here, that's uh, one of our dominant male bears up at uh, Kanaka Creek Regional Park. And I guess just reminding us that, of course, yes, bears are in the area. Uh, so what potentially he is doing there is either marking it to just uh, communicate to the other bears, or sometimes bears will do this for, for mating as well. All right, so on to my other favorite. So uh, I know I said that uh, bears were my favorite, but I definitely have a soft spot, spot for raccoons. Um, you might have noticed my friend Ricky the raccoon in the back here. Um, and actually, I just had an encounter with a raccoon on the weekend myself. So raccoons are very unique in the way that they look, of course, because they have that very distinctive striped tail and they have that black mask. So they're pretty um, easy to identify in that way. Um, the reason why it is thought that uh, the raccoons have that striped tail is that um, it helps women with camouflage, even with their coloring of their fur, it's kind of gray and brown and black, really helps them with camouflage. And it, it is also thought with the black mask that um, this help uh, um, reduces glare and it helps them with their uh, night vision. Because of course, raccoons are nocturnal, so they're busiest and most active at night. So those are things that are meant to help them. So another little quiz. All right, so I'm gonna ask you, how far can raccoons rotate their hind feet? All right, Jeff's got the, some numbers there. So 30 degrees, 60 degrees, 90 degrees, or 180 degrees, what do you think? Give you a few more seconds there to click on your answer and then click submit. Just waiting for a couple more. Okay, I think that's it. Here we go. There we go. All right, so if you said 180 degrees, you are correct. So when you think about it, so we as humans, we have our hands like this and we can rotate them 180 degrees. But now try and do that with your feet. You can't do it, right? So that's a pretty amazing that uh, raccoons are able to do that with their hind feet. And so what enab this enables them to do is to be great climbers. So there have been um, cases in cities and things like that where raccoons have scaled skyscrapers and got themselves in predicaments like this a little fellow, um, but not to be too worried because um, there's some other interesting abilities that they have. So if you see the raccoon in the bubble, so it looks kind of scary. So this was something I found on the internet and uh, this was a raccoon that scaled up nine stories and then turned around and jumped from the building with like a horrific a crowd below seeing this happen. And he actually landed on his feet like a cat and ran away. So he was totally fine. So they have that ability like cats in that they um, are able to land on their feet. They're also one of the few mammals that are actually able to climb um, down like face down. That's actually what I saw the raccoon on the weekend doing. He was climbing down a, a fence. So they have that ability. So it's pretty neat uh, that they're able to do that. So let's look at what raccoons are eating. So in the wild, they would eat fruits and berries, nuts, insects, clams, frogs, fish, uh, eggs, young birds, and sometimes rodents. But again, like the bears, they get themselves in trouble. And uh, because they're opportunistic, just like bears are, they start eating a lot of uh, foods that are associated with humans. So things like garbage, uh, pet food, they'll get into people's gardens, uh, bird feed again, fruit trees, um, fish ponds. You know, sometimes people have the little goldfish in their ponds, they like those, um, as well as small livestock and the feed again. 
So just reiterating, reiterating that it's really important that we are managing uh, tractants for all wildlife in our own backyards. And raccoons are similar to bears in that they have to start eating large amounts of food towards the end of the year um, to put on a, a fat reserve to help them make it through the winter. So um, one of the most interesting and intriguing behaviors and probably misconceived things about raccoons is the thought that they are always washing their hands and washing their hands. So what it actually is, is that raccoons have thousands of nerve endings that come into those front paws. And um, so they're extremely sensitive. It's the most sensitive sense, they have, sense that they have. So what it's believed is that when they have their hands in water, it actually enhances those receptors and they can actually feel better. So um, often in the wild, you would see raccoons like this fellow here in a creek or a pond digging around. And what this enables him to do is actually to feel um, for food and things like that when he can't even see it. So he can actually identify what the food is or if it's edible based solely on touch, he doesn't have to see it. So that's often what raccoons are doing while you'll see them always getting food wet. It's really helping them to recognize it and make sure that it's edible for them. You know, raccoons are extremely intelligent creatures and um, they've been known to remember solutions of, uh, to tasks for up to three years. So if you've ever had a raccoon get into your garbage or things like that, they are very intelligent creatures and um, easily figure those kinds of things out. So also something else to remember. And so the last thing we'll look at is where these raccoons are living. So probably more and more of us are seeing raccoons in our backyards, potentially at our homes. So normally a raccoon in the wild would be living in um, a den, uh, like sometimes in an old burrow, or they would be using um, a hollow of a tree. Uh, but because they are very adaptive, um, often people will find them in their attics, in their sheds, in their garages, and of course we don't want this. So um, best thing to do is um, if you're trying to exclude raccoons from a place in your structure, you just want to make sure that uh, all the raccoons are out and the kits are out before you close anything up. So that's it for my two animals. So hopefully you learned something interesting about bears and raccoons. And now I'm going to turn it over to Jessica to talk about coyotes. Thank you, Zoe. That was amazing. Even I learned a little bit. So I'm going to take it away with the wily coyote next. Um, coyotes, as we've uh, observed from the polls, are, are seen by a lot of people. Uh, they move into urban areas very easily because, oops, uh, attractants from humans. There we go. I'm not going to spend a lot of time describing coyotes since many of you have already seen them. They are a species of wild dog and they can be distinguished from wolves and domesticated dogs mostly by the shape of their face. Coyotes have very narrow pointed snouts and ears and they have a grizzled kind of beige, brown, and gray fur. One of the things I find most amazing about coyotes is how adaptable they are. They have a range that stretches all the way from um, Arctic tundra up in Alaska down to the deserts and almost tropical rainforests of central Mexico. And because they live in such a diverse habitat, they have adapted in many, many ways in diet and behavior and a bit in appearance as well. So here I have two, two different pictures. The coyote on the left-hand side of your screen probably looks a little bit more like what you're used to seeing in our lower mainland. And that's because we have relatively mild winters, uh, so they don't need a really heavy coat compared to the coyote on the right, who you might find up in Northern BC, Yukon or Alaska. And because of the harsh winters there, they have to have a much denser fur coat to survive the cold. Now, one thing I haven't really talked about is how coyotes have adapted around people because not only do they live in a diversity of habitats in the wild, but they've come into urban spaces as well. And they've learned very quickly that humans mean danger. 
So the coyote was historically a diurnal animal. That means it was active during the day. That's when it hunted and foraged. But often in cities, they have shifted their behavior to become nocturnal, and that allows them to avoid people and, and our vehicles especially. So incredibly smart, smart creatures. They can live either solitary or in packs. Most of the time they're in packs, but when we see them, they're usually on their own because they, they like to hunt either by themselves or maybe with one other individual. It increases their, their chances of successfully catching food. Now, because they, they work in packs, uh, they really need a lot of um, ability to communicate and send messages to one another. So my quiz for you on coyotes is how many different varieties of vocalizations do you think they mean? And what I'm trying to say here is how many different kinds of sounds do they make to communicate different messages, like a bark versus an owl, or a howl, sorry. So take a minute and uh, choose which uh, people were optimistic. Uh, it looks like most of you figured 38, and 38 is pretty, pretty high up there. The true answer would be 11, and I still think 11 is quite impressive. They have different barks, hops, growls, wolves, yelps, uh, all sorts of different styles of communication, and this, this helps them to work together as a team and benefit from each other's actions. And one thing I found exceptionally interesting about coyotes is the fact that they can recognize each other's voices for their, each other's calls. And they do this by listening to the tone, the speed, and sometimes the accent of the other coyote. And they're able to recognize members from either even other packs that they met long ago from a far distance away. So that's pretty impressive ability. So the next thing I was going to talk about is coyote diet. And it ranges quite drastically between their, their natural diet and their more urban diet. And that's primarily because like we talked about, their behavior is different, diurnal versus nocturnal. So when they're living in a more natural environment, a green space, they're hunting during the day. So they're looking for their prey under the sun. And that means that they're able to catch things like rabbits and snakes, fish and frogs, and they eat a lot of grasses and berries, as well as carrion, the dead things that they happen to find or come across. But in our cities and towns, in urban spaces, that diet is wildly different. Now, there is a lot of food available in cities, and that's why coyotes are coming into those areas, but it's certainly different food. They rely a lot more on rats and mice since those are attracted to our garbage and things like that. They're very, very abundant. They also encounter a lot more medium-sized animals like raccoons and things like that that can be prey. Um, they're still eating grasses and fruits and vegetables potentially from your gardens, um, but they also have a fallback food. When they can't find those things that they normally eat, they can always resort to eating human trash. All right, so I am having trouble advancing my slides. Would you mind moving on to the next one for me? Okay, and of course there's no place like home and home is where the food is. So whether they're in a forest, a tundra, a desert and they're digging out their, their homes or whether they're in a city and they're looking for spaces in culverts and things like that, coyotes are smart and adaptable. So. Typically throughout most of the year, coyotes are much like bears in which they will sleep just about anywhere, including out in the open, under a, a tree, or in tall grasses. Uh, in the city, they tend to look for a little bit more quiet areas. Like I said, culverts are a good one, or they might burrow into the side of a hill in, uh, in a more green space. 
They only dig a den typically for pupping season, which is in the spring when they, they have their pups. They have about four to seven in a litter. And there's usually only one mating pair within a coyote pack that have pups. And then the entire pack work together to help care for those pups and protect them. So it's pretty incredible to see the, the dynamics of their packs and how that comes into play with raising their young. Thank you, Zoe. The next one I'm gonna talk about is my friend over here, Pepe Le Pew. Uh, skunks, I think, are just remarkable creatures and I'm really excited by them. I know that's an unpopular opinion and that skunks have a pretty bad rap out there, um, but I'm hoping I can sway your opinion a little bit as I teach you about them. So skunks come uh, from a family, uh, they used to be considered a part of the weasel family, they're now their own family. Uh, there are 10 different members within this family, so 10 different varieties of skunk, including the skunk weasels at the top over here. Uh, those are the only ones that are not native to North America. But here in the lower mainland, we only have one variety. It's the one you're all very familiar with, the striped skunk. Striped skunks can live three to 15 years, but they're usually on the lower end of that spectrum as there are a lot of dangers for skunks in an urban environment. Um, they grow to be under 10 pounds and a little under a meter in length. And they are solitary by nature. They live almost their entire lives on their own, uh, with the exception of mating. And they're also quite defensive. I should note they're nocturnal as well. So moving on to skunk behavior. Uh, skunks are pretty fascinating and I think they're one of the most widely recognized animals in North America. And I don't know if that comes from a fear associated with them or not, but even young children tend to be able to recognize a skunk by its stripes. And a skunk stripes are more than fur deep. They go all the way down to its skin. So in the middle picture on the screen here, you can see a baby skunk. These are the patterns right on its skin and the fur will grow in in the same way. And a fascinating uh, piece of information about them is every skunk has unique stripes. As people, we can't always tell the difference between one skunk or another. But skunks are very attuned to the width and pattern of other skunks' stripes and are able to recognize them by it. The last picture on the screen there is an example of a, a skunk with extremely wide white stripes that give it almost the appearance of being albino. So each skunk is individual in its pattern and the purpose of these stripes is to direct any potential threat to the stink end of the skunk. But as you know, it both widens, the, the markings come to a point at the tail and at the nose and this helps uh, skunks to confuse their predators and hopefully buy them a couple of seconds before a predator advances on them and this allows them to, to act with their primary defense and I'm sure you're all familiar with that. Most of us have smelled a skunk even if we haven't seen one. They have an incredible musk fluid that they're able to secrete from glands close to their to their bottoms. I do, <laughs> I'm seeing a question come in about if I have a pet skunk. Unfortunately, this guy here is not a living skunk. I would love to have a pet skunk, but I do believe that wildlife belongs out in the wild, so I do not. Um, skunks, they spray only when most motivated. If there is no other option, that's when they resort to spraying, and that's because Replenishing that musk, that stink fluid, takes a lot of resources. They have to eat a lot, it takes time, and while they're doing that, they're quite defenseless. They have no other means of protecting themselves. So because they don't want to spray you, they, they're gonna give you a lot of warning signs if they can help it. Of course, if you come around a corner and startle a skunk, it's gonna be very reactive, but if it sees you from a distance. It's going to tell you you need to keep your distance by stomping its front feet. That's the first sign of saying stay back. And the second one is it's going to turn around and lift its tail. And if you haven't got the message by then, it's probably your own fault. So moving on from their behavior, I thought we could move into a quiz about their, their ability to spray. And I wanted to ask you, how far do you think a skunk can accurately spray its stink? 
And when I say accurately, I don't mean that smell is gonna carry on the wind. I mean, they're actually able to target you and hit you with a stream of very stinky fluid. And here we go, here are the results. Ah, I like that it looks like we're tied for physical distance um, bubble versus bathtub lengths. And I would argue physical distance bubble is a perfect distance to stay away from other people right now, but skunks can spur a little further than that. So the real answer here is the two bathtub lengths, about three meters or 10 feet. And that's a pretty amazing length to be able to target and, and spray. So you definitely wanna give a skunk a large berth with lots of space. I do have a personal story about being sprayed by a skunk as most people do. I'm not going to share it right now, but you're welcome to ask about it in the question and answer period if you're curious. I do also want to point out that there is a difference um, in treatment method of removing that smell for a person versus a pet. There are many ways that people can use that are unsafe for pets, so if you ever encounter or have your um, pets sprayed by skunks, please research a pet-friendly way of treating the problem. All right. Moving on to what's for dinner. Skunks are pretty versatile, but with their nose and mouth being only inches from the ground, they, they have limited availability of food. So they're looking for things on the ground like mice, grasses, they eat a lot of mushrooms, but a variety is safe for them. They'll eat eggs or small birds that fall out of trees, and they eat a lot of insects. But in urban environments, those things aren't as readily available. So they often will dig up fruits and veggies from your garden. Skunks are great diggers. They'll eat rats, eggs, gore, uh, corn, or other grain, but primarily skunks in urban spaces rely on the easy food of our, our scraps. And this has led to an obesity problem in urban skunks, which is quite unhealthy for them. So uh, the last thing I'm gonna talk about with skunks is where to find them. They are great burrowers and unlike coyotes who will sleep or bears uh, sleep out in the open, skunks need uh, a place to hide since they are fully nocturnal. They need somewhere dark and protective to, to hide away during the day. They have really strong front claws and paws for excavating and they will dig either into fallen trees, they'll hollow out areas like that, or in urban spaces often they find refuge under people's deck, uh, desks, not desks, don't worry, they're not in your living room, decks, and uh, as well as under sheds and things like that, where they, they feel that they have a strong, secure platform above them that makes them hard to get for predators. Skunks are also exceptional mothers. They, they raise four to six offspring every year, and their babies weigh about 35 grams, which is about as much as a light bulb. Uh, so they're really tall, uh, tiny, really light, uh, but within just a few short months, by the end of the summer, they'll have learned all they can from mom and they'll be ready to go on uh, and live a solitary life of their own. So well, that's uh, a little bit about skunks. Uh, if the den is disturbed at any point, the mother will try to relocate her babies if it's safe to do so. So I know a lot of people have problems with skunks in their, their under their decks or in the sheds. Uh, if the mother knows that you're there and you're investigating the area, please give her a chance to move her babies out of that space. She will if she can. And all of this discussion on urban wildlife leads me to a thought I I frequently consider, and that does wildlife really belong in urban spaces? And everybody's going to have their own opinion on this. Mine personally is yes, they do. But as people, we have a responsibility to create a more safe environment for them. And that's because we're the ones that altered that space in the first place. So in order to help you out, I have five short tips of things you can do. There are many more and we'll include some resources at the end of the presentation. But in the meantime, uh, you can work on creating small natural spaces for them, places with plants and water rather than paving or, or using decks. Uh, we want to leave them areas where animals can forage or hide. Uh, please avoid leaving your lights on outside if you're wanting an animal-friendly yard. 
Uh, nocturnal animals especially avoid places where there's bright light because it makes them feel unsafe and inhibits their night vision. Please, please, please avoid the use of rodenticides or pesticides, which are chemicals used to, to get rid of rats or insects. When we use these chemicals, it doesn't only target the animals that we intend, but it will work its way up the food chain when those animals get eaten by other animals, like some of our friends that we've talked about today. Please look for other safe ways to treat any pest problems you may have. Uh, keep your food sources away. We know that's an important one. And avoid habituating animals. And what I mean by that is, as hard as it may be, if you encounter an urban animal, do your best to give them a very negative association of people. You can do that by yelling, moving quickly or aggressively, and teaching them that it's not safe to come near people. If they're able to keep their distance, it will help them to have a, a safe and longer life. All right, and then our last one also, um, you know, a lot of us are in regional parks and uh, it's very potential, there's a great potential for us to um, interact with wildlife. Um, for sure, some of our regional parks um, have a lot of bears and things like that, which is totally fine and there's nothing to be worried about. It's just important to remember that. So things to remember when you're out in, um, in parks and things like that is to travel in a group you know, make sure you're always being alert and keeping an eye out for things. Um, uh, sometimes avoiding wearing strong perfumes. We talked about the bears having that excellent sense of smell. They might create um, curiosity for them. Um, also remember to keep your children close, um, you know, in certain times of year, especially, you know, if your kids are running up ahead and they run into a bear or something like that, um, it could be a problem. Uh, sometimes, especially, you know, you should, when, you're in regional parks. Um, we always have signs up letting you know if there's bears and things in the area. So, you know, you can make noise, you can clap or sing uh, songs while you're on the trail, or as long as you have a group and you're talking and just making sure that you're, you're making a bit of noise. Um, it's really important to keep dogs on leash. There's been incidences in the past where dogs off leash have run off, uh, interacted with a bear, and where does the um, dog go but running straight back to their owner with a bear following behind it. Um, potentially think about not wearing headphones while jogging or running as you're not as alert and you might not hear things. Um, check for a uh, fresh bear sign and stuff like that, scat and things like that in parks and see if you see that. Um, never approach a bear or any wildlife. Um, you know, keep a good distance away and then leave uh, the area when it's safe to do so. When it's safe to do so. And then of course, never, ever, ever feed wildlife. Um, so the last thing we thought we'd just share with you is some resources. So if you ever do have like encounters with a bear, there's this um, uh, report all poachers and polluters line. So basically it is, um, it goes to the conservation officer service. So um, if you have an encounter, now they don't need to know if you just happen to see a bear, it's more if it was um, getting into trouble or getting into an attractant or something that. Wild Safe BC is a great resource to, there's a lot of information as well as Get Bear Smart Society, uh, the Stanley Park Ecology Society has done a lot of work on coexisting with coyotes. Um, this was a line, uh, BC SPCA animal kind. So they have um, accredited um, pest removal um, companies. So like Jessica was saying about just being safe if you do have those um, animals that you need to remove from an attic or something, make sure that you're using um, an animal friendly reputable company. And then as well, if there is, um, you find a wild animal in distress, there's different local wildlife rehabilitator uh, in the areas, or you can call the SBCA as well. And that's it. Thanks everybody. Um, I appreciate you all um, joining us today for this webinar. Hopefully you learned something new and interesting about uh, those nosy neighbors and, um, and hopefully found a new appreciation for them as well. Well, thanks, Jessica and Zoe. So we're going to open up to questions now. And again, if you go to the bottom of your screen and you'll see a Q&A and you can just type your questions in there or you can type it in the chat box if you want. And um, as you're doing that, 
<coughs> excuse me, I'm going to share a quick story. Um, Jessica mentioned about skunks and um, I had a skunk that was living under a shed in my backyard and it would literally play with my cats. It would chase them around the yard and at first I panicked and then I realized it was actually playing with them. It would chase them around in circles and then go back underneath the garage, uh, I mean uh, underneath the shed and then they would, um, the cats would go back and look in a little hole and it would pop its head out and chase them around in circles and they would just do this all afternoon. I was amazed to watch it. And, the, and this little skunk was really very playful. And then it would play with the hose at night. Um, yeah, so I saw a very different side of skunks just watching this one in my backyard. Absolutely. Every urban animal has its own distinct personality. And we don't always get to see the fun they like to have, but they, they certainly do. Um, and it's like somebody just pointed, uh, asked if they can hear your skunk story, story as well, please. Uh, my skunk story comes from when I was working at Burnaby Lake. I had a visitor come into our nature house and tell me that there was a baby skunk out in the parking lot. And I went out to investigate and ended up finding about, well, five of them. I found five uh, wandering out. They were still quite young and very wobbly on their feet and I was concerned about them being active in the day. So I ended up calling um, uh, a wildlife uh, assistance kind of program and they advised me that the best thing for them to do based on their approximate age would be to take them to wildlife rescue, that they shouldn't have been out out of, the, out of their den yet. Uh, and when I asked a little bit more about it, about a safe way to round them up, they said, no, they're about five weeks old, they can't spray yet. Unfortunately, they were wrong. <laughs> so I ended up uh, collecting all five of these little skunks into a box and taking them to wildlife rescue where um, many of them ended up um, being very healthy and being released again back into the wild. But I found uh, that luckily baby skunks don't carry as much fluid as their parents. So it maybe wasn't as bad as somebody else's experience, but I got sprayed a good few times on these cute little guys. Uh, are there any other questions or comments? I don't have a skunk story, but I have a bear story. So this was probably over 10 years ago, I guess, before bears were really starting to come into urban areas or people were familiar with it. And um, so one morning I woke up and I looked out my backyard and my bird feeder was on like one of those rods and it was like bent like way over. And I just was like, oh my gosh, the raccoons. I thought, oh, the raccoons have climbed up and gotten the bird feeder and, and you know, they've gotten into it or whatever. Didn't think anything of it. I think I left it. And then the next night I hear the noise again and I thought, oh, those darn raccoons. I go out there, I look, two huge black bears in my backyard with the, the bird seed. And um, so, one and one was just totally fine just hanging out one took off but i was trying to say you know get out of here and stuff like that and, and um eventually took off but in the morning i had forgotten that not only had i had that one um hanging bird feeder but there was also one hanging in front of my kitchen window there and so when i woke up in the morning there was a huge muddy bear print on my kitchen window where the bear had leaned up and knocked over the other bird feeder to eat all the birds eat out. So um, I myself have been uh, been a bad person and have contributed to uh, attractants for wildlife. So I've learned my lesson and that's why I say if you live in bear country you have to be really careful what you do in your yard. Um, I have a question actually about uh, raccoons because I currently have um, every summer at a certain point underneath my front porch, uh, uh, a raccoon, and I'm assuming um, her babies that are underneath there. But I'm never sure, you know, like how to make sure, like I'd like to close up, there's a little hole that they've dug there underneath the porch, it's a wooden porch, and just wondering how you, how you ensure they're all out. Yeah, I think it's it's basically so it's a bit seasonal. So they, they recommend that you wait until, um, towards the end of summer would be the time. So in the beginning of the year and stuff like that. Um, there is techniques that people do to like putting light in there or like a ghetto blaster with noise to kind of scurry them out and stuff like that. Um, so probably, yeah, you want to make sure so it's later in the year so that the... Uh, 
Um, yeah, I guess I'll just wait till the end of summer because I d certainly don't want to trap them in there, especially if there's babies. Yeah, exactly. And that's like the biggest thing. I think what happens is that, um, so that's why too, we, um, you know, uh, there is some pest control companies who are more familiar and that the SPCA recommends that are animal and humane friendly for people if they're having those issues and don't know how to deal with it. But yeah, usually waiting till later in the year, then the kids should be old enough and on their own for sure. So first of all, I want to thank you, um, Jessica and Zoe for an awesome presentation and webinar here. It was really informative and I learned a bunch of new things, which is great. Um, and uh, yeah, just, uh, just a couple of notes uh, before we close up here that, um, first of all, we hope you enjoyed today's webinar. And if you want to find out more about Pacific Parklands Foundation or Metro Vancouver, um, you know, there are the websites here, there are the URLs. So again, I just want to thank everybody for joining us today. And um, I hope you found that uh, informative and um, yeah, and hope you'll join us for the next webinars. And thanks again to Jessica and Zoe and also to Janet from Pacifica Parklands Foundation for uh, sponsoring and hosting the series of webinars. So have a great afternoon, everyone. Um, it's still cloudy where I am, but hopefully it, uh, it clears up where you are. And enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. Bye-bye.